a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. And coming over this next hour, returning to a practical conversation today about the way we hire people. I'm talking in business and in Christian ministry organisations. The truth is selecting the right people to work for you is much more difficult than it first appears. Well, our special guests today say most people can look good at the casual interview. So today we're going to unpack how to avoid the most common hiring mistakes. Two special guests joining us, Dr. Ken Byrne, a corporate psychologist for over 40 years, and also joining us, the Reverend Peter Corney, OAM, a leadership consultant and the author of 12 books. Both Ken Byrne and Peter Corney are co-authors of the book Hire Right First Time, a practical guide for staffing Christian organisations. The book's described as a godsend to Christian organisations. So I want to make a special welcome. First of all, Dr. Ken Byrne, welcome back to 2020. Terrific. Nice to see you again, Neil. And to the Reverend Peter Corney, welcome along, Peter. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, good to be here. Let me start with you, Ken. Uh, When we talk about a godsend or a real asset for Christian leaders, uh, people might be saying, you know, why are we going to be talking about hiring people in your organisation? But I imagine the outcomes for an organisation if you hire right first time may look a whole lot different than if you hire wrong first time. Uh, Give us your (laughs) insights here. (laughs) <laughs> Certainly do. Well, hiring wrong the first time is enormously expensive, more so than most people think. Usually you hire wrong and then you go through the pain of putting up with the person and finally, if you're lucky, they leave or you find a way to get them out. And then no one takes time to say, what did this cost us? And there are many costs, but the biggest cost is what we call the opportunity cost. So you've hired someone, say, as a youth pastor or as a, uh, a school counselor, and after six months, they leave. You have to then ask, where would we be now if we hired the right person the first time? Uh, I, imagine, I imagine that somehow or other, uh, hiring right the first time, uh, this might also apply to being the right person to hire in the right job uh, the first time. And, and so there's, there's some ways in which, I guess, when we talk about uh, the employer hiring the right person, there's going to be some lessons in the conversation as we go through this hour that might also be about being the right person in the right role, the, you know, the square peg in the square hole, not the square peg in the round hole. Would that be the case? Well, do you mean for the employer or do you mean for the applicant? So in this case, uh, just talking about the applicant for a moment, but uh, of course we'll get back to the business or the organisation that's doing the hiring, but uh, there's going to obviously be something good for the applicant as well if they are in the right place at the right time. Yes, we we never do someone a favour by hiring them into a job they're not suited for. Okay, well, let's talk about uh, some, let's get into practical things uh, early, straight away. Uh, When you're, uh, first of all, uh, sorting through the applications uh, because you're looking for a new staff member, uh, is there something special here, not only in the advertising for the position, but when the applications begin to come in? Uh, when do you start to apply, you, you know, some Christian uh, definition of, uh, you know, using faith in God to actually help you in this process? Should I come to you, Peter, uh, on this one? So far as, you know, the sort of uh, faith application that an employer might have. Well, obviously, the way you advertise the job is important so that it's clear um, for example, in you know, churches vary in their emphasis and their theology. So if you were from, for example, an evangelical Anglican church, you'd want to make it clear that that's the kind of person with that kind of theology and belief. Um, that they would, that's the sort of person that would apply rather than just anybody. Um, so that that's that's a key idea. What you know, what is the actual belief structure of the person you're after now you're not it's not going to be perfect the way you present that but you need to give an indication otherwise you might waste a lot of time on people that are are not suitable because of their their framework 
Let me ask you about belief structure here. This is a very interesting one, no doubt, for anyone who is leading an organization or running their own business, because some will be saying, what are you saying here, that I should only employ people who have the same Christian belief to me? Is there room in the Christian organization for people who are of no faith uh, or of a different faith? Uh, what What are your thoughts here, Ken? Well, I think it depends a lot on the institution. If you're if you're running a church, it doesn't make sense to hire someone who has no faith. That just doesn't work. Uh, on the other hand, let's say you're running a Christian school and you want to hire a French teacher. Well, it may not be so important for that person to have a Christian faith, but you do want to know what their underlying values are. Do they value caring for people? Uh, And that is terribly important. Well, this is a pretty topical question at the moment now because the government is looking at the whole question of the freedom of Christian schools in their right to hire who they want. And um, there's a lot of um, misunderstanding out there. And there's very little evidence that Christian schools do actually have um, sort of practices that, that... that uh, are against people who might be a bit different. But obviously, they will try and start out to to employ a teacher who's got a Christian background and a Christian faith. But there's been a criticism from some people that the schools will um, sort of, what's the word I want? um, Discriminate. Discriminate much more than they actually do. I think this is one of the very big hot topics right now. And uh, there are those who will say Christian schooling is even under threat. Uh, If you employ people who don't aspire to and even sign off on the ethos of the school, um, but there, of course, is going to be uh, an issue that's perhaps even a different and a particular scenario around Christian schools, which are a battleground in some sense for religious freedom right now. But I guess the main part of our conversation really is going to be if you're a Christian who has a business, and it might be a mainstream marketplace uh, shop front or uh, some sort of organization or industry, uh, but that's different to a church or a church run or a church uh, affiliated Uh, organization like a Christian school. So let's come back to that sort of mainstream business here and the sort of people that you might employ because oftentimes if you're looking for particular skills, uh, let me come to uh, to you here, Ken. If you're looking for particular skills and you have, you're have you a Christian, you have a Christian organization, you might not necessarily uh, be able to find those skills that come with the right belief structure. Uh, what are your thoughts here? Well, that's right. But do remember that the book is written also primarily for Christian churches and Christian organisations like a Christian aid organisation or a Christian welfare organisation. So those kinds of organisations are, generally speaking, looking for someone sympathetic with their Christian values. Churches, I think, are a specific issue that is slightly different. But if we go to Neil's question about a business, a shop front business that may not be a upfront Christian, happens to be owned by a Christian, but they're a, a pool servicing business, and you mentioned skills, there's overwhelming evidence that people get fired not because of their skills. People get fired because of their character. Mm. And first and most important, you must find out what the character of this person is like. You can teach people what they have to know in most cases, but you can't teach people to be kind. You can't teach people to be willing to work in a team and a host of other characters. Yeah, and, and even in most secular businesses, people don't get fired for what they don't know. They get fired for character reasons. Let's talk uh, some Christian spirituality. If you are the person who is in charge of hiring or if you own the business and you're the one who uh, hires employees or you're middle management, um, what about the role of uh, prayer in making hiring decisions? Uh, If I come to you, uh, Peter, 
uh, as a you know as a long time uh, minister of the gospel in fact uh, Peter you were in fact uh, you know leading one of the largest Anglican churches in Australia uh, hiring decisions were obviously a little bit different in the church context but the role of prayer when you're looking for new staff give us your insights well usually you know churches will have a small committee or a panel who who assist in the um, selection and interviewing of people now that those meetings will should always start with prayer seeking god's guidance and wisdom as they look through the people that they could possibly employ so that's the first point and the second point is even in a one-off interview with someone um, you would generally open that interview in in prayer of a general kind saying asking god's guidance for both of us uh, for the interview person and the interviewee um, to guide us as we go through this process now so Which, prayer is very important ken you had some cautions about prayer though as to what not to do when you pray yeah, well now you shouldn't use prayer in a manipulative way for the interviewee in other words you know you could say a prayer in a certain kind of way that um, might might feel manipulative. It's got to be a fairly straightforward prayer of asking God's guidance for both the interviewee and the interviewer for clarity and um, in the process. I imagine that you're not looking for a bolt of lightning uh, to come out of the blue, uh, that this is uh, the right one or the wrong one. Uh, that prayer, very important though at the start of a uh, an interview session if you are a christian and you're leading that uh, that uh, particular interview because uh, just having a very simple prayer makes a very big statement in itself doesn't it uh, thoughts here from you ken what's what sort of uh, impact does it have that you might pause and you might say a very brief prayer well i think it it sets the tone that this is a Christian organization, there's no doubt about it. And I think you can also use the the prayer to plant the seed in the applicant's mind by saying, uh, please, uh, God, grant Bill the courage to help us see who he really is during this short time we have. So you suggest to the person that we want to see who you really are. We don't want to see the, the mask that applicants put up um, that's you know, or uh, of the number of the numerous applicants we have, please help us to see the real bill. Um, so that can be a, 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 a way of planting a seed in the applicant's mind at the very beginning of the process. I want to come to uh, some of the interesting and very practical aspects of what we're talking about here. And uh, when you've gone through an interview process. Oftentimes, your applicants will present references. Uh, how do we, as leaders of business and of organisations, uh, make right, wise, practical decisions when we're actually following through before we actually make the offer? If I come to you, uh, first of all, here, um, uh, Ken, uh, thoughts on, on following through on references? Reference checking is without doubt the single part of the hiring process, which is done badly, consistently. And it's because, first of all, no one's been trained on how to do it. By the time you've interviewed a series of people and now you're ready to make the final decision, people are tired. They just want to get on with it. And by then, people have had a gut feel and they've kind of already picked who they want. So reference checking becomes just a, often it's just a tick the box exercise that isn't done at all. That is a serious, serious mistake. Yeah, in our experience, about 20 to 26 percent of references, written references um, from the person and their qualifications are actually incorrect or false. That's a very high percentage. Now, now um, people, for example, can claim they have a, a, a master's degree in this, that or the next thing. And the really odd thing is that people don't ever check those. It's amazing. Yeah. It's quite extraordinary. And, um, and people often falsify them. The second level is that obviously even a person who's not falsifying their material is going to put their best foot forward. They're going to describe it in the most, um, the best light. So you have to get behind that as well. So, so yes. 
Is there some special wisdom that you apply then? Is there, I guess, you know, you could even uh, spiritualize this a little bit and say uh, if you're relying on God uh, to be able to identify uh, some of those things that might be uh, not authentic, uh, even fake, uh, even deceptive, uh, some of those things, I mean, because some people can look you in the eye and lie, can't they? Uh, Ken, oh, any thoughts here? I mean, this is one of the things, isn't it? That how you rely on God, uh, sometimes you're looking for that uh, insight. Well, again, this should be part of the prayer throughout the process that, that the selection panel does privately. Um, the reference checking should be done in two stages. One is people list degrees or certificates. Early in the process, you can have an administrative person or someone on the panel mm-hmm. ring the place and say, did Fred Nurk get this degree at this time? And often you'll find, well, he was here and he just was close, but he didn't finish the last course, so he didn't get the degree. That's what you commonly find. Or you'll find we don't know who this person is at all. That should always be done. And then in the in the book, we have a whole section on checking references where it needs to be a conversation with the referee. And it shouldn't be the job of the panel to chase the reference. You should have the applicant ring the reference and say, I have some particular times when an employer would like to speak to you. Could you pick one of these times and I'll have them call you? You let the the applicant set all that up. Saves you a lot of time. And then you need a structured series of questions that you should ask about every applicant. And it starts off with very general, positive questions. Tell me about what he was so good at. Give me some examples of his strengths. But then it works on to some more challenging questions. Tell me, when this person worked for you, what did you privately wish they had done differently? Now, that's a very hard question to lie about. And then it ends with a gracious way of concluding the reference check. But it should be a step-by-step process so that you ask the same questions about every serious applicant. Yeah, so there are two things here. There's the, um, the question of references about their qualifications. And there, if that can be checked by someone uh, by ringing the institution. That's the, the second one is, is checking the... Um, and what would you call it, Ken? The character. The character. And the skills. So, a character reference, yeah. Uh, my uh, suspicion is that uh, somehow or other, uh, a lot of employers uh, will be floating along on a wing and a prayer and the expectation that uh, if we've had a prayer, um, surely God will come through. Uh, how do you get a balance here in expecting that God is going to deliver into your hand the right person with the right skills and the right character, um, and also uh, the balance of of doing all these checks just to verify that everything's right. Well, this is like the student who doesn't study for the exam, but the night before they pray fervently that God's going to help them get a good grade. It doesn't work. Prayer is not a substitute for doing a proper, thorough job. Yeah, we, we are cooperating with God. God has given us responsibility um, to check things and ask the right questions. Um, so we're part of the prayer process. So it's not just saying a prayer and then hoping it'll all be all right. So we've got a great responsibility. We're created by God with the power to do that. And just quickly, because we're coming up to news, getting these things right might mean the difference between your businesses flourishing and your business contracting or even failing. Uh, Is this how important uh, getting these decisions right? Uh, Ken, thoughts just quickly? Absolutely right. Hiring the wrong employee is like trying to move forward in a race carrying a weight tied to your leg. And one problem employee can use up most of your time and energy and wreck your business. And the reputational cost is huge. Oh, Let's come back to some of the damage that is done to not only Christians in business, but Christian organizations, including the church or schools, when we think about the reputation 
of those organisations that's on the line. If I come to you, Peter Corney, uh, talking about reputational damage. So if you don't get some of these things right, really bad outcomes are the result. Uh, Peter, thoughts here on reputational damage? Sure. Well, I think uh, because of the Royal Commission um, some time ago, it's had an enormous impact really on people's attitudes towards the church, I think, uh, particularly related to children and so on. But of course, there are other issues that that, uh, reappear from time to time. There's the over-authoritarian leader who who takes over control of, uh, say, a Christian organisation or particularly a Christian church. That's also caused a great deal of uh, of damage, um, and then you've got financial um, manipulation as well and dishonesty. So um, you might say that the um, sexual issues, financial issues, and autocratic leadership are all things which reoccur from time to time, and. Um, they're, they're things we've just got to guard against when we hire people for very key positions. And, of course, no applicant is going to come along and say, you should know I'm basically dishonest, or you should know I would manage people like Hitler. I mean, it's not going to happen. I'm going to invite listeners into the conversation. You might have your own thoughts. Uh, You might even want to let us in on maybe a bad decision that you might have made that's affected your small business uh, or that's affected your role in a Christian organisation. Very happy to hear from listeners on 1-800-316-316. I imagine the truth of what happens when you are in business, when you are the leader of an organisation, that you do make mistakes that you sometimes get things wrong. Uh, Let me ask you, Ken, uh, this is pretty typical, isn't it? You're going to make mistakes if you're in business. Uh, You just want to minimise them. Thorough screening process is selecting astronauts as you have to be a top performer with years of experience to even get in the door. And even then, they have a very rigorous screening process goes on for a year, and they made one horrendous mistake. So mistakes come with the territory. You want to minimize them. But you can't minimize them by saying, well, I'm a good judge of character. I can pick the right people. Just doesn't work that way. Because... The game is set up. It's a, it's it's like a stacked game. It's you know somebody playing with more cards, because the applicant has every reason to present themselves favorably, and every reason to keep hidden from you anything they know will make them look less attractive. For example, people with an authoritarian personality don't even know that they have one. Exactly. And so then you get you get say a, a narcissist. You know, presenting for a job, trying to pick that is very, very difficult. And um, but, you know, that's the problem that Ken's point about people always putting their best foot forward is understandable. We'd all do that. But the people who don't even understand their personality faults, that is a real trick. Yes, yes. Okay, come back to, uh, say, a Christian school for a moment. And while we're talking about reputational damage, things that can be done when you, uh, you know, when you get things wrong, um, school teachers, school principals, um, you know, you can't always tell, as you say, just looking at someone uh, whether or not they're going to have all sorts of character flaws. Uh, I imagine that uh, the people that you do hire, you're probably going to have to shape that person. And I imagine that even character can be shaped when they become part of the culture of your organisation. So when you're actually at that point where you've chosen to employ someone, is there opportunity here for helping to shape that person's future? Well, I'm not sure you can shape character very much, Neil. Um, if a person is basically selfish or if they're basically abrupt and rude with other people or they're, they're uh, authoritarian or they're narcissistic and they have to have a lot of positive aggrandizement those people don't know they have that problem 
and trying to tell them they have their problem is often a, a thankless task because the response will be, no, no, you don't understand. I don't have the problem. You have the problem. People come with their character pretty well shaped by the time they get to you. Now, you can, if they have the right characteristics and the right character, you may be able to guide them, but very slightly. You know, if someone doesn't smile by the time they're 21, you're not going to teach them to smile. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. Um, you can teach them lots of skills, but you can't change their character. Yeah, take the issue of servant leadership now. Christianity speaks a lot about servant leadership, following our servant, our master servant, Jesus. Now, you can learn to become a better servant, but if you've got a character flaw that that sort of stops you being that, and there are some character flaws about that, you it's very hard to change that person. So are and there are there some uh, particularly key questions uh, that you can ask at the interview process that might expose some of these character flaws? Uh, Ken, yes. Ken, what have you been working with over the years? Uh, what key questions might you include in a uh, in a interview conversation? Well, I would say to the person, you know, we all learn lessons in life. That's just the way things are. We all, you know, have experiences we learn from. So what have been the three most important lessons you've learned in the last few years? In the last few years is important because I don't want to know about a lesson they learned when they were 14. I would know in the last couple of years. So they tell me they learned a lesson. But then I say, now, how did you learn that lesson? Invariably, we learn lessons by mistakes we've made. But if I say to someone, tell me about the mistakes you've made, that's a much harder question. Is that a red light uh, when you have a, an interview uh, with a potential employee uh, who is not likely to want to identify their own weaknesses or mistakes? Well, then that's a very serious problem. Yes. If, if they can't do it in an interview, they're certainly not going to do it when they've come to work for you. If, or you say to someone, you know, we've all done things that we, we embarrass ourselves about. When was the last time you did something that embarrassed yourself? And the person scratches their head and they think and they say, well, I... Because most people will say, are you kidding? I did one yesterday. Or I did it last week. They have no trouble identifying the time they embarrass themselves. <laughs> but some people say, oh, I don't, don't, don't think I've ever done that. Now, that's a really enormous red flag. Or you say to someone, think about the person in your life who's your toughest critic. Don't tell me who it is. Just think about that. Let me know when you have someone in mind. Okay, have someone in mind. Now, now the point about the book is that many of these questions and key ways of going in are all there. Yes, we outline all this in great detail about how to get behind the mask the person puts up. Would it, be, he, would it be fair to say that at a job interview, every single person has a mask on and uh, that you are going to have to ask these sorts of pointed questions to get beneath the mask? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And then you have to listen to the answer. Now, I know that sounds unusual, but I've seen so many interviews in which I've been asked to sit in, you know, for a client, and people say the most outrageous things, and the client just goes on to the next question. Let me ask you... The clues in there. Let's talk about what happens then, because uh, some will be saying, well, of course, you're never going to find the perfect employee. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of things that you might need to still be working with. If I come to you, Peter, uh, yeah. what role is there in what sort of graciousness has there to be uh, in managing someone that you have newly hired? Uh, thoughts here on, on, you know, just working with someone perhaps they've been vulnerable but maybe not as vulnerable as you might have liked um they're going to be on a learning curve a lot of things to learn when you're approaching a new position what sort of graciousness do you need to have as the boss or as the one who's made the hire well if you've if you've done your job properly to begin with in the interviews and all the rest of it 
and you've you've weeded out the people with the extreme problems like the narcissist the person who um you know who who um has a, you know problem with um with for example ken um with, with the authoritarian leader authoritarianism and so on if you've managed to get behind the mask and pick that up then many of the people you'll be working with if they're reasonably kind of balanced people are capable of being trained and taught and changed so that that would be a fundamental assumption that a christian would make because I mean, in a sense, we're committed to the idea that all of us can change and grow and develop through the Holy Spirit throughout our whole life. So that's a commitment we have theologically. Let me ask you, uh, Ken, uh, Christian leaders in business or Christian organisations, and you're looking for character, I imagine that in that interview process too, uh, you're looking to identify the sort of virtues that we might look for as Christian believers. And that might be a little bit different to the virtues that a non-Christian employer uh, perhaps might even look for. Any thoughts from you here around the sorts of virtues that might actually be a green light or those that might be a red light? Well... you want to take the I think one of them is the idea of servanthood. Servanthood is a challenge to any kind of personal pride. Oh, that's below me. Oh, I wouldn't do that. Someone else should do that. I remember a guy who had a tremendous influence in our church uh, and had many, many senior positions in business and other things. And when he retired, he used to empty the rubbish bins at the church. And, he, and it taught me, you know, <laughs> it gave an example to me. you is too undignified are a servant of the people so servant you, you can pick people who don't like to be servants but how do you pick them well they, they avoid those kind of jobs and they they act in a way that sees themselves as having some kind of priority yes being more important than other yeah. people So seeing things that you might identify saying, oh, that's below me, someone else ought to do that job. Uh, Someone needs to put the bins out, but it's not going to be me. Uh, Someone's going to tidy up the the bathroom, restroom area, uh, but it's not going to be me. Uh, Come back to this, I mean, if we're Christians and we're expecting that God's favour and blessing is going to be on our business, uh, or on our church or our Christian organization, um, we're going to be expecting that somehow or other uh, God is going to lead the right people to us. How much of God leading the people to us uh, is based on uh, our own uh, skills or our own intuition, or is there some inspiration or revelation from God? as something like a superpower that we might think that we have as Christian believers because, you know, if we have the mind of Christ, we want to be able to see through some of these dreadful things that would bring bad outcomes for our organisation. Peter Corney, uh, you've been working in this space for decades. Uh, Is there something special about the intuition that a Christian believer has and that can be applied in the hiring process? Yes, I think there is. And... um and so when we when we go into these situations, we're praying for guidance. And by guidance, the Christian means something like intuition and other things through how we get the sense. But of course, it's in cooperation with the God-given intelligence and ability to make choices and decisions that God also places on us. So God never delivers us from the responsibility of our job and thinking about it and approaching it with the intelligence that he's been given to us. So it's a combination of those things. It's not just something that drops out of the blue every now and again. Now, that might occasionally happen, but it's usually rare. Yes. And intuition, you know, the the biggest problem that people have is they say, well, I'm a good judge of character. But that isn't enough for the interview, because you have to have the right tools to uncover the character you're looking yes. at. 
Let me come back to what happens in that Christian business uh, or organisation before such time as the need for hiring this new staff member because undoubtedly the culture of the organisation is always being equipped in some new way. You're always going from one strength to another. You're hoping that the culture of your organisation is not being watered down and you don't want that new employee to to water it down and uh, be destructive in the culture of your organisation. But some insights here perhaps on just how strong the culture of your organisation needs to be so that when you are hiring, uh, you know that you're getting the right person who's going to enhance your culture and not destroy it. Um, come to you here, um, perhaps Ken, uh, thoughts on, on, the, on having a good culture in your organisation? Well, culture basically means here's the way we do things. Here's what we think is the right way. One of the ways to test this is if you're hiring someone, they should always meet some of the other people who work there. The idea of just one one person or a panel doing an interview and then delivering up the candidate is a mistake. Um, they should always meet some of the other people. If they're in some sort of supervisory position, some of the people they supervise should meet them. They don't necessarily be part of the interview, but they can form impressions. I remember I was about to hire someone, but part of my process was they always met the other people in the office. They would take them out for lunch or have coffee with them or something. And every person came to me and said, do not hire this person. (laughs) Now, I'd be a fool to to dis- disagree with that. But had I not done that, I'd have hired someone who immediately everyone in the office would have disliked. So you always get them involved with other people. The other thing is that in terms of seeing the character, often what, the way you see it is not part of the formal interview. So, for example, um, we might have coffee and I would say to someone, oh, we'll just wash these up. And I want to see, do they help carry the cups out? Do they help do the washing up? Or do they wait and will let me do it all? Or let, you know, some other servant do it? Um, I remember having a, a workshop in my office and we stopped for morning tea. And someone came up to me and said, Ken, can I get you some tea? And I shouldn't have to do that. But that told me something about her. And I saw that evident in the way she treated other people in the workshop. But these are the things that people think are not part of the interview. So you need to be observing the person from the very first contact you have with them. Well, we have been blessed to be able to hear some overflowing wisdom today Uh, from a couple of experts on getting things right first time when you're hiring. In fact, the co-authors of Hire Right First Time, a practical guide for staffing Christian organisations. Our two guests have been Dr. Ken Byrne, a corporate psychologist for over 40 years, and the Reverend Peter Corney, OAM, leadership consultant, author of 12 books. He's written on a lot of different dimensions. But this particular book we're talking about today, and uh, I should recommend this to you because uh, I've read it Uh, it is outstanding it is so practical it's such an easy read Uh, and uh, to get the book it's called Hire Right First Time a practical guide for staffing Christian organisations it's published by Arrow Leadership Australia and it comes with a free 120 page user guide Uh, this book shows you exactly how to choose the right people it's available on Amazon Australia too and I'll just mention the conference where you can see Ken and Peter both speaking at the CMA, Christian Ministry Advancement Conference, on May 28th and 29th in Melbourne. There's a website, cma.net.au, to connect with that CMA conference in Melbourne. Uh, You can also connect with Peter Corney at petercorney.com and check out all of those books that Peter has written. And uh, to connect with uh, Ken, of course, through the CMA website, cma.net.au. Well, to both uh, Ken and... Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.